Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm a teaching guy here. I'm honored to serve under our senior pastor, Mark and Natalie Avalos, and we're continuing our series today. We're getting to the end of it, y'all. We've been working on it all summer, the Summer of Joy, where we have been going through the book of Philippians, which is a book that Paul wrote from a prison cell. And he's basically saying in the book, you can have joy no matter what the situation is around you because joy has nothing to do with what's going on around you. It starts on the inside, which is a source for great hope. So we're going to wrap that up today. And we're going to talk about, I think this may be the most practical thing in this whole book, because today we're going to talk about worry, anxiety, and fear. Now, I know nobody in here struggles with that, but I know you've got somebody you know that struggles with it. So you can take notes today and you're going to take back to your family and you can show them how to do this. Cool with that? All right. A couple quick announcements. Uh, Next week, we're going to start signups for our small groups. So next week, uh, under the pavilion out there, we'll have signups for different groups to participate in. And let me tell you something. I understand our lives are super busy. Ain't nobody got time for small groups, right? But let me tell you, this is something you need to carve time out for. Uh, There's a guy named Sean Acor. He did a bunch of research on happiness. And one of the things he said is the number one predictor of the ability to stay strong when life gets hard and difficult times hit is your connectedness to others when stress hits. But he says, most of us, what we do when things get hard, we pull away and we go, "Let let me get this sorted out. Let me just kind of go into myself. And he says, that's actually the way to actually sabotage yourself. The number one way you're going to get through hard times is having a network of people that you're connected to. And look, it's great to show up here on Sunday. We're glad you're here. But if you want to really stay strong, you've got to find a group of people from this church throughout the week that you're connected with and you're sharing life with. Because if you've been here long for a while, you know that when things get hard in people's lives around here, this church rallies around people. A few years ago, I had a health issue. And man, I just could not believe the love and support that were poured out on us. I just felt so loved. The the challenge with this is a lot of us, we cry out for help when everything hits the fan, but we have no relationships with others. And you call the church and we want to help, but we don't know anything about you. And we're trying to scramble to help you. But when you've got a network of relationships that have already been built through this, man, it's the most natural thing. You just call and say, hey, man, so-and-so is at the hospital, whatever. And everybody rallies around. And that comes through spending time during the week in community, not just showing up on Sunday. It comes through sharing life with other people. And so these small groups, they're more than just about studying the Bible. We're going to do that. But it's about getting connected with the body of Christ and the community of Christ so that when life gets hard, you've got a support system. And the beautiful thing is there will be times when you're down and there will be others around you that are up and they can help lift you up. And then you'll have times where things are going great and others around you are struggling and you can help lift them up. And that's how we all rise together but you got to get into those communities. So I'd encourage you guys, again, ain't nobody got time for it. I don't have time for this. Look, make time for it. Cut something out of your schedule to make time for small groups this this fall. Cool? Cool. All right. One more thing. (laughs) This is the pep talk I have to give myself every August, and I'm going to give it to you. August is a rough month here in Texas. Anybody relate to that? Some of you guys, man, y'all work out in this heat, and it's like the ninth level of hell out there in terms of heat. And I, man, some of y'all are welding out there and doing very important jobs. I want to say, first of all, thank you for your hard work in this heat, you guys. Man, you guys do some hard labor. Thank you. Keeping the world running. But let me tell you this. August is a hard month. Did you know the number one month for mental health illness check-ins is August? Especially down here in Texas, because it's hot. And the heat makes a huge difference in how you see things. And you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, it's already 90 degrees with 100% humidity. And you got to go to work in this. Listen, keep your eyes focused on positive things. We're going to talk about this this week because, man, this, this heat can be oppressive and it can really mess with your head. Another thing about August, I don't know about y'all, but I bleed money in August. Everybody wants a piece of me in August. My electric bill is high. My kid's school is asking me for maintenance fees. I'm like, I don't want to pay for maintenance. And oh, you got to pay it. It's not optional. I'm like, well, I don't want to. They're hitting me up for money and there's school supplies and there's just all these expenses. And you're like, I'm just bleeding money here. Listen, it's August. Just remind yourself when everything is hard this month, go, you know what? Only three more months of the heat. We'll be okay. All right. (laughs) I'm just kidding. 
We'll be out of this by December, I promise. But seriously, I have to remind myself, you know what? When it gets hard and I'm like frustrated, I'm finding myself getting short-tempered with my wife or with my kids, it's August, Joel. Calm yourself down. Dip your head in a bucket of ice or something. But there really is this physical component to the heat and the stress of it. So I just want to encourage you guys, you're not the only ones losing your mind. You're not the only ones going insane. But let's, we're going to focus on something today that actually I think can help right in the middle of that. Okay, that's my August pep talk. I always have to remind myself it's August. That's why life is miserable right now. So... Wonderful thing, though, my, my two favorite ladies in the whole world, my daughter and my wife, their birthdays are in August, so it gives us something to celebrate. Yeah. Um, don't tell Emily, but hers is today. Don't tell, her, don't tell her I said this, but her birthday's today, so. Yeah. Shh, 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 don't tell her. I'll, I'll get reamed for this for telling you. Okay. All right, so a few years ago, uh, I went on a safari in Tanzania, Africa. Now, it wasn't a shooting safari. It was a photo safari, so I wasn't killing anything. But I was shooting pictures of animals. And we went to this place called the Ngoro Ngoro, Ngoro, Ngoro Crater. And it's this huge, ginormous crater. And in the middle of it is this huge concentration of African wildlife. So we, we, we loaded up in this Land Rover. It's a big Land Rover. And the whole roof would peel back so we could actually stand up in the Land Rover and kind of peek over as the driver was slowly driving through these dirt roads. And, man, we'd see elephants. And we, we pulled up to one tree. And he's like, okay, you will eat your lunch here. And there's hippopotamuses. And then he, he let us know that hippopotamuses are the number one killer of humans in Africa. Did you know that? Like the number one animal that kills things? It's not lions. We think it's lions. No, hippos kill more people every year than any other animal. And he's like, all right, eat your lunch. But if he comes to you, you better run. So, we, you know, so we're eating there. And then, then we, uh, we came to a group of baboons that were just sitting on the side of the road. And he started talking about how violent baboons are. Like baboons will literally tear like their, their enemies like in half. And uh, he's like, and they can jump up to 20 feet to attack their prey. And we're like, we're like they're right there. I'm going, is, should we be concerned that there's baboons within jumping distance? And he goes, ah, don't worry. Just don't anger them. <laughs> don't anger them. Okay, I won't anger them. So we're going along, and uh, we pull up next to this huge green sheet out in the middle of, there's like this tree and there's this truss with a green, enormous green sheet like the size of this. I'm like, what is that green sheet? And as I'm looking at it, a fly, a big fly lands on my arm and bites me. And I was like, what the, ow, it's a fly. And so I was like, hey, what, I, I asked our driver, our guide, I said, what's that green sheet for? And he said, oh, it's for tsetse flies. I was like, well, what are tsetse flies? He says, very dangerous flies. They will give you African sleeping sickness. <laughs> so I, I, I was kind of like trying to stay calm. I'm like, um, I just got bit by a fly. Should I be concerned? And a doctor behind me goes, I would be. <laughs> I'm like, what the? So I asked the guy, and I didn't bother to ask, why are we parked next to the sheep that attracts the fly of death? Like, let's move along here. The rest of the day, we're in this beautiful, amazing place. Elephants, wildlife galore, things you dream of seeing, you know, things you see on National Geographic. I'm seeing them in the flesh, but you know what I'm freaking out about? My fly bite. And as the day goes, the, the, the bite is not getting smaller. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So that night we get to the lodge. And you know what the first thing I do is? I Google it. Bad idea. And they say, lots of muzungas. That's, that's what they call white, white boys like me. Muzungas have died from African sleeping sickness. And they showed the spots where these people had gotten bit. And literally, there's a pin right where we would have been. And I was like, I'm dead. I am dead. It's all over. I went to bed that night. I'm freaking out the whole night. I'm like, oh, I, love I love my wife. I'm never going to see her again. The next morning, I come to the doctor. I'm like, hey, look, I, like, I really want to get serious about this. Like, this bite, like, should I be concerned? And he goes, look, here's the thing. Even if it was a tsetse fly and you get African sleeping sickness, it won't show up until you get home. They said, just enjoy the trip. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, enjoy the trip as you prepare to die, right? And he's like, and sometimes it won't even show up for five, six years. I was like, what? This thing is in my body that for like six years from now can kill me? And he's like, yeah, yeah, but don't worry about it. Well, that was 10 years ago, and I'm still here. So I think, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I think I've made it out alive, Okay. 
But here's the thing I know about all of us. Have you ever noticed we have the capacity to ruin the most amazing experiences by getting worried? Everything's so good. Something has to happen bad here soon. And we can ruin the most wonderful experiences with a drop of worry, anxiety, a little bite. You have a cough and you're certain it's lung cancer. And we all worry. And listen to me. I know that every one of us deal with this. Now, some of us are better at hiding it. Okay? And some of us are more chill. Typically, there's one chill person married to a freak. In my marriage, I'm the freak. And my wife is the chill person. And, and here's the challenge with a lot of my fear and anxiety. I know it's irrational. I know the facts don't add up to what I'm fearing. And my wife, she will give me, she's a very rational individual. She will say, there's no reason for this because it's for you to worry about this because this, this, and this. And I go, sweetheart, I love your rationale, but my fear is irrational. <laughs> your facts ain't going to work on me. I'm just going to freak out. And you can't do nothing about it. She's a, and finally, she just gets mad and slaps me, and that works. But <laughs> she's like, just get, just, you're fine. You are not dying of whatever you think it is. And I, but I'm freaking out, and I can ruin some of the best experiences by worrying. In fact, I love this quote by um, Montaigne. He said this, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. How, come on, be honest. We can relate to that, can't we? We can all relate to that. And some of us, we cover our worry a little better with denial. But you worry about stuff. You obsess over certain things. You're like, if I can just, how can I get this right? How can I fix this? And you obsess and you obsess and it keeps you up at night obsessing over that little thing. And some of us are just freaks. We just worry, worry, worry about everything. No reason to worry, but we got to have something to worry about. You know, there was a study uh, done a few years ago, and it's one of these studies that you're like, eh, I don't know if it's replicatable, but it's an interesting thing. They asked a bunch of people to write down the things they were worried about, and they checked with them a few months later, and 85% of the things that people had written down they were worried about never happened. And the things that actually did happen, they realized they actually weren't as bad as they had made them out to be in their mind. And they actually had better capacity to handle and deal with the challenges. But they had spent all of this emotional and mental energy worrying about stuff that never happened. And I know some of us are going, ah, that's the key then. If I worry about enough stuff, it won't happen. That's not how it works, right? But it can ruin us. Man, it can really mess with our heads. And we're, so many of us are living with constant anxiety and stress. And, and here's the really challenging part. You know, in the past... We used to have enough to worry about with just our family and those around us. But now if you flip on the TV, you can find 10,000 other things to worry about. <laughs> Cow flu in Kazakhstan? Oh my God, we're going to die. Have you, do you know where Kazakhstan even is? No, but it's killing cows. Are you a cow? No. Can, can cows go from Kazakhstan? No. Calm down. Yeah, but it's a serious thing. Not only do we have our own problems, but we have other problems across the world. And so we're sitting here thinking about our problems. Man, what if I get the same thing that took out my dad? What if it shows up in my body? Man, what if the economy never gets better and I can't retire when I thought I could? Man, my kid, what if he never comes to his senses? What if we're estranged for the rest of our life and I'm one of those old, alone people, because we just can't get our differences worked out. And I think that's what our fear is all based in, this question, what if? What if this happens? And some of you have very good reasons for asking what if, because you got burned in the past by something. You go, what if it happens again? So we're going to look at this today, because the Apostle Paul, man, he gives some very practical advice for how to deal with worry, anxiety, concern, fear, Whatever you're willing to call it, we've all got some what-ifs that we think about over and over again, and it can ruin our lives. Not only that, you know, I was talking to a doctor the other day. He said, honestly, over half of the illnesses I deal with are anxiety-based things that people, if they could just get their anxiety under control, the physical illness would go away. There's actually really dire consequences that can happen in your body if you don't get this anxiety under control, and some of y'all know that already. So Paul, I love this. He says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when things are good. He says always. That, that could be, the, that, that could be the, the closing message right there for today. 
Rejoice always. Figure out a way to rejoice always. And you say, how can I rejoice always? Well, because we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him to those who are called according to his purpose. Ultimately, anything that God allows into your life is something that in some way he is going to turn for good. So that's how you can rejoice always. But Paul doubles down. He goes, "Uh, I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. And then he says this, let your gentleness be evident to all. It's really interesting. Another translation of this, the word is interesting. It says, let your reasonableness be known to all. Reasonableness. Reasonableness, I think, is just your steady, even keel temperament, no matter what's going on around you. That's the thing that it says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Man, when you can learn what we're about to talk about today... You can learn to be even keel no matter what's happening because you're reasonableness. But he calls it gentleness here, right? He says, the Lord is near. Now, obviously one version of this is a lot of people think he was talking about the Lord is, is coming soon. He wrote this 2,000 years ago, but I actually think it's even deeper than that. I think he's saying, yes, the Lord is near. He's going to show up one day, but the Lord is near. He's with you right now. He's walking with you. His spirit is living inside of you. He's as near as anyone ever could be. So you can have confidence in that. And this is where he says this. So don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends, that means goes beyond ever being able to explain it. All understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, that's y'all. Because said, y'all. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I think he makes really two really practical attack angles here. He says, guys, if you want to deal with anxiety, here is the anxiety cure. First, he says, you need to pray about whatever you're facing with a focus on gratitude. Now, I understand when we get into a bind, gratitude is not our first thought. Our first thought is, this stinks. Jesus, save me. How many prayers? I, I, think he, I don't think he minds prayers like that. God, save me. But one of my favorite authors, actually is my favorite author, G.K. Chesterton, I love this quote. He says, I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Mm. Anybody can identify what's wrong with the situation. It takes a whole nother level of higher thought to figure out, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff wrong here, but there's a whole lot that's right too. Yeah, yeah. My kids are not everything I'd hoped they, had be, be, they would be yet. But man, thank God they've got a job. Thank God they're living with me again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's always something to be grateful. My health isn't what I, what, I, why, what I wish it could be. But man, sure is better than the alternative of being dead. I get to wake up this morning and breathe another day. Man, the situation in our country isn't all I thought it could be, but ah. Uh, Man, I'm so grateful for what we have. And this is something that's truly lacking in our world today because so many of us, we have life so good that we actually take it for granted. My grandpa, he grew up in the Great Depression. And forever, throughout his life, he was terrified of not having enough for good reason. He lived in a dirt poor shack in the bayous of Louisiana. And on top of that, he got polio when he was a kid and lost his ability to walk. It literally crippled him. For the rest of his life, he actually had his leg fused, so he was able to work with a cane and stuff, but he was absolutely helpless because polio had devastated his life. Now, we don't even think about polio these days. Do you know why? Because before you even realized what was happening to you, you got a polio vaccination as a kid, and it took away the possibility of you getting polio, but polio used to devastate people's lives. We don't have to even think about that concern anymore. So many things that our people that people that came before us had to worry about and were concerned about and had to deal with, we don't even have to worry about it. 
There's not food shortages in America. It's not the best food sometimes, but you're not, there's, there's always access to social safety nets. There's access to churches. There's places where you can get things you need. And yes, people are in need and there's injustice in the world, but we've got it pretty good and we need to keep our eyes on that. And we've got a lot of people today that are raised to be ungrateful and to fight injustice. And you ask them, what are you fighting against? And a lot of them can't even name what they're fighting against. I'm just fighting injustice. There's so many things wrong with the world. Okay, name a couple things. Well, it's wrong. And I'm going to put my tent right in the middle of this college campus until things get fixed because I know what's up. I'm 18. (laughs) And you don't even realize that the reason you have the freedom to even protest is because some people fought a really hard battle to give you freedom of speech and to protect it throughout the ages. You don't even realize that the reason you can complain and gripe and stuff because you don't have to go to work because you're getting money from mom and dad to pay for college or a loan that you really probably shouldn't have even qualified for, but they're giving it to you. And we sit around and we complain and moan. And listen, don't get me wrong. There's some stuff that needs to be fixed in the world, but we're not going to fix it from a place of anger and hatred. It's got to start from gratitude and saying, man, we've got it really good, but we can do better, but we've got it really good. We've got it really, really good. And it takes next level thinking. Any idiot can figure out what's wrong with the world. But it takes next level thinking to say, but man, there's so much right in the world. There's so many things that could be so much worse. We never, you know, have you ever noticed we never see news reports from people, you know, a news reporter saying, ladies and gentlemen, I am here from this small African country that has been at peace for 120 years. It's just amazing. You never see that. Instead, you hear about the country that erupted in violence Because bad news sells. It's what sells. So that's what what people focus on. And our challenge is, first of all, you've got to recognize that there's a whole lot to be grateful for and start from that place. Start your prayers with gratitude. I don't think God minds you complaining and calling out to him. But if every prayer you pray is focused on the negative, here's the challenge with this. You know, Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. He's obviously talking about seeking and finding the kingdom, but that's actually a principle of how your mind works. You're going to find what you're looking for. You will. If you're looking for negativity all around, you're going to find it. If you're looking for positive things and like examples of God's grace all around you, you're going to find it. If you're starting with gratitude, it's going to open your eyes to be grateful for the good things you do see around you. It really is a wonder that we somehow still manage to all get along in this world, isn't it? (laughs) Really, when you think about it, it's amazing that we have not all torn ourselves to shreds. It's amazing that we live in this place. And yes, there's a lot to fight for to change things, but we start from gratitude for what we have and for those who paid the high price coming before us so we could live in this wonderful, amazing place we live in. For the gratitude for God's grace through Jesus, who forgave our sins and made a way for us to be in right standing with him. Which leads to the next point. Paul says, finally, start your prayers with gratitude and just present everything to God. When you feel yourself starting to worry, present your prayer to God. Secondly, finally, actually, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, what's noble, what's right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things and whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. His second point is this, keep your mind on the right things. You have to really think about what you're thinking about. And this is one of those challenging things. I can't do this for you. Only you can become an active participant in this and start paying attention to what your thoughts are and go, wow, I'm really thinking a lot of negative thoughts lately and identify it. And some of us go, well, I'm just being realistic. That's me, right? I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. (laughs) Maybe, or maybe I'm just seeing, focusing all the time on the negative, but you've got to keep your eye fixed on the right things. There's this thing actually uh, in, in, it's a cognitive bias in psychology. A cognitive bias is a default thing your mind goes to that's actually wrong. And you have to actually intentionally realize what's happening and correct it. And it's called the availability heuristic. It's this bias that occurs when we judge the likelihood of an event based on how easily we can recall similar events. If we can vividly remember instances of that event, we deem it to be more common than it actually is. 
So what your mind does, because it can't remember everything and hold on to everything, it goes to the most immediate piece of information that you've received. So if you've been watching the news all day long, 24 seven, your mind's immediately gonna rush to the most recent bad piece of news you heard that somehow relates to you. Some friends of mine, they lost their house in uh, Hurricane Harvey. Like the house flooded, majorly flooded. And recently when we were, that, those floods came a few weeks ago to Houston, I texted them to see how they were doing. And they're like, oh man, the trauma is setting back in. We're already panicking, throwing our stuff in the car. And they had very good reason because their house had been flooded before. But that's how a lot of us do. We had a bad experience and I get it. Some of y'all have had some bad experiences and it's very readily available to your mind. So anything that looks like what happened last time, we start to panic and freak out. It's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen again. But the likelihood of it actually happening again is probably very slim. Now, Houston, your house flooding in Houston, probably highly likelihood because that seems to happen every few weeks. But that's what happens when you build your whole city on a bayou. But that's a side note. The challenge we have is whatever you've been filling your mind with, if you've been filling it with garbage and negativity and negative things and all the negative things happening in the world, your mind is immediately going to go to those things and you're going to start freaking out and worrying about those things. But if you're focused on what's true and noble and what's right, good report, another translation says, that's where your mind is going to go. So that's our challenge. Every day when we wake up and we go, oh, it's August, here we go. Are we going to start focusing on, first of all, what's true? This is challenging because a lot of times we think something's true that's absolutely not true. There's a verse in Ephesians, and it talks about spiritual warfare, and it says you've got to cast down vain imaginations. That's the King James Version. You go, what's a vain imagination? Well, a vain imagination is a thought where you think something is about you that has nothing to do with you. You ever have those conversations in your head where I know why they did that to me. They're thinking about this and that about me. And I, oh, you know what, the th I'm going to tell them. What you did. And you know, the, the real truth is they aren't thinking about anybody but themselves. Amen. You're not that important to them. They're just an idiot to everybody because they're so self-focused, just like you're focused on yourself. Vain imaginations are making things about you that aren't even about you. And we spend all this time worried and hyped up and angry and frustrated and anxious about what people are saying about us, and they're not even thinking about you. I know they did. No, no, that's just the way they drive all the time. <laughs> Has nothing to do with you. They're horrible drivers, right? Don't make it about you. So you go, is it true? Eh? It may not be true. It seems true to you, but your emotions can lie, especially in August. <laughs> Whatever is noble. Is it noble to call a person an idiot? Probably not. I repent. Sorry. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's the thing we've got to do every day. When the anxiety sneaks in and you start thinking, oh, what if, what if? That's your trigger words to go, oh, I'm worrying about something. So you know what I need to do? First of all, I need to say, God, I'm concerned about this. Present your request to God. And then trust that the peace of God is going to, the transcends all understanding is going to come and guard your hearts and minds. But then you've got to protect your mind. It's not a one-time thing. It's a daily, minute by minute, hour by hour battle. You not only present your request to God, but once you give it to him, don't take it back. And don't keep filling your mind with all the what ifs, the what ifs. And yeah, I know you think it's just, oh, I'm just making sure, you know, I'm, I'm just concerned about it. No, make sure, look, you don't want to be naive. You don't want to be ignorant. But if you're living on a steady stream of garbage and negativity, that's where your mind's going to go all the time. And especially, guys, in this election season we're in right now, look, get a little bit of news and then turn it off. Get your update, but make sure you're staying focused. And you know, one of the easiest ways to do that is every morning, start by not looking at your phone. Get an old school paper Bible, plop it open and start reading in the Psalms problem with looking at your Bible on your phone, I have this problem too, is all sorts of other things pop up. And before you know it, you're not looking at your Bible anymore. You're on Instagram. Get an old school paper Bible. If you can't find one, go to a thrift store. They'll sell you one for 50 cents. There's tons of them. And just pop it open and start your morning reading in Psalms and see King David saying, man, I'm certain of this. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm certain my God's going to provide for my needs. I'm certain that, man, God is going to put his angels charge around me. He's protecting me with his angels. And you start to look for those things with gratitude, and that's what you're going to see. And that's how we keep our minds fixed on the right things. And that's how we just, that's the cure for anxiety in this crazy world 
full of anxiety and fear and worry. But I believe God wants us to live with total and complete peace, our reasonableness known to all of those around us. You guys receive that? All right, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, you promise it'll guard our heart and mind as we present our request to you. So I pray for those this morning, man, they're dealing with some heavy burdens. They've got their reasons for their fear and anxiety, but Lord, we know that we can put confidence in you. So I pray there's an act of faith this morning. We would cast all of our anxiety on you because we know you care for us. And we know that as we do that and we don't take it back and we stay focused on thinking of your goodness, Lord, we are going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, I'm gonna say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is gonna come and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him in eternity. It starts when you confess your sins and and let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you there under the do it again sign. You guys, I pray you will have a great victorious weekend. Pay attention to what you're thinking, thinking about, okay? Second of all, in two weeks, this service will start at 11.15, so we have more time to do kid transfers, all right? So for about half of y'all, just come at your normal time, okay? 11.15. <laughs> that starts in two weeks. We'll see y'all then. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.